The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Good afternoon. What a joy it is to be here. Thank you, Dr. Master. Thank you to the board. Thank you to Dr. Piper. And it's good to be home. Greenville's been home for my family for many, many years. So every time I drive down 385, um, it always feels good. So glad to be with you all. And I was talking to my wife last night, and she said... uh, you know, she was praying and, and talking to me, talking to me about being here. She said, are you nervous? I said, well, of course, every time you preach the word, you're nervous. But I said, the thing I'm looking forward to the most is I know we're going to sing before I have to speak. And that's one of the highlights, <clears throat> excuse me, of this conference every year. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. And we'll be looking at the whole chapter. As we look at our theme this afternoon at the Trinity and the gospel, the Trinity and the gospel here in Revelation chapter 5. And before we hear God's word, let's pray together one more time. Father, now we need the sevenfold spirit, the spirit in his fullness to open blind eyes, to unstop deaf ears, to make Jesus the one who is chief among 10,000 and all together lovely to us. So would you do that? Would you exalt him in our time together? We pray in his mighty name. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, this is God's holy, inspired, and therefore inerrant word. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, Sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood... You ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You've made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down. And worshiped. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy, inspired, and therefore inerrant word. Last week, I came across an article uh, with some fascinating news about new technological developments in the realm of letter opening. Didn't sound fascinating at first, but it was. Uh, about uh, 577 letters or so were found in the Netherlands that were sealed with an ancient technique called letter locking. They were about 400-year-old letters. 
And they were done this way as a kind of security device. This is your ancient face ID technology. So they had these letters all folded up, and the scholars quickly realized that if they were to break the seal, they could lose the contents of the letters, and they were very valuable historical artifacts. So using AI and using a bunch of different algorithms, they were able to unseal the letters digitally and through artificial intelligence and read the contents inside. And one of the researchers commented, quote, we learned that letters can be a lot more revealing when they are left unopened, close quote. I don't think John would share that researcher's sentiment. Because as we come here to these bridge chapters in the book of Revelation, and that's what they are, they bridge uh, the first part, the first three chapters, to the last chapters of Revelation, beginning there in chapter 6 and on through to the end of the book. As we look at these bridge chapters, they open with the plaintive cry of the Apostle Paul, of the Apostle John, who's worthy? Who's worthy to open this scroll? And so what we're going to see is that there is one who is worthy. And as he unseals the scroll, we learn the plan of the universe, God's sovereign plan for all of world history, for all that any telescope will ever be able to capture. But again, some context will be helpful. Revelation 4 and 5 might be, as I was meditating on these passages in preparation for this, they might be the most Trinitarian chapters in all of Scripture. They have the Trinity all over them. And they have two twin themes that, that we're, John is concerned for us to understand. And understand in chapter 4, the sovereignty of God the Creator and the glory that is due to Him as the Creator. And then in chapter 5, the sovereignty of the Lamb who is also with God, the Creator, and worthy of this glory and honor. And they set the stage, as I said, for everything that comes afterwards. And what I want us to see from the passage before us is this. The triune God planned the gospel before the world was created, revealed the gospel through the Old Testament, and made Christ's substitutionary atonement the centerpiece of this gospel, all of which results in the everlasting worship of the Trinity. The triune God planned the gospel before the world was created, revealed the gospel through the Old Testament, and made Christ's substitutionary atonement the centerpiece of the gospel, all of which results in the everlasting worship of the Trinity. And we'll look at this text under four headings. In the first place, in verses 1 through 5, the gospel is the triune God's plan. The gospel is the triune God's plan. Look there again with me at those verses. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the, the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. The first question that comes to mind when we look at this text is, What is this scroll? What is its identity? And scholars debate the meaning of the underlying term here. Was John thinking of a scroll or a codex, which is the forerunner of our modern book? I think the likely answer is that it's a scroll. And as we ask that question, something else immediately comes into our view, namely that if we, we know our Old Testament, we know that John has a lot of different Old Testament imagery in his mind as he writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 29, 11 speaks of this scroll. Daniel 12 and verse 14 speaks of this scroll. It's well-known imagery. In fact, some scholars have argued that Daniel 7 and verses 9 and following underwrite the entirety of Revelation chapter 5. But it's clear at least that John has this Old Testament background and imagery in his mind. And what he's concerned to help us understand is not so much the shape of 
of what this scroll or codex is as what it symbolizes. Namely, this writing outside, the writing within, is symbolic of God's plan for everything. And that's why the angel with the mighty voice cries out, who's worthy and no one's found. Because the implication is that because we are all sinners, no one can understand this plan in its fullness. No one is worthy because of their sin to open the scroll. And then, of course, we learn that there is one who is worthy. And as we consider that background from the book of Daniel, if you went back to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9, that's the Ancient of Days vision, which is right there in Revelation 1, as John blends the imagery of the Ancient of Days and one like the Son of Man who comes to the Ancient of Days, and Jesus is both of them in some mysterious, wonderful way. He is the Ancient of Days. He is the Eternal God. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's divine. And yet, as we come here, the, the centerpiece of that revelation in, in Daniel 7 is that this one, this Son of Man who comes, inaugurates the latter days. And when you read about that phrase in the Old Testament, in the latter days, over and over again we read that phrase, it was the days of the reign of the Messiah. And so with Daniel in the background and this scroll before us and John seeing this vision and one coming to unseal the scroll, his point could not be clearer. The Lamb has inaugurated the latter days. And that's the time when the Messiah would reign. And what is the beginning of that reign? What's the complex of events in the redemptive historical outworking of God's plan? The complex of events that is the advent, the birth, the life, the ministry, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ, and the subsequent outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. That's a complex of events that inaugurates those latter days that the Old Testament looked forward to. And John is saying to, is saying to us as he witnesses this scene in heaven, they've begun. They've begun because of who this Lamb is. And one of the central features of the latter days, according to the Old Testament, as we'll see in a moment, but brought to the fore in the New Testament, is that a decisive point in the plan of God has occurred because of this complex of events. And that decisive turning point is nothing less than Christ himself. And therefore, all of human history, all of the plan that is written, as it were, inside and without the scroll that the Lamb can unseal because He alone is untainted by sin. He alone is the sovereign Lamb. As that is unsealed, what comes to the forefront but the revelation that judgment or blessing all hang on what you believe about the Lamb. That's what John sees here in this heavenly worship scene. And at the heart of it all is the Trinity, as we're going to see as we work through this passage. And so when we consider the scroll and the plan of God that it represents and the only one worthy to unseal it, we're immediately taken to, to realms that are beyond our comprehension, to the time when there was no time. To what we'll hear about next from Dr. Fesco, the, the covenant of redemption. The fact that the triune God planned everything. That he's sovereign over all of history, all of the universe. And that he lets us know part of that plan. He reveals it to us. And in that revelation, he wants us to see that it all comes to a head in Christ. The centerpiece of all of his revelation. The centerpiece of heavenly worship, which as we'll see is the pattern for earthly worship. Then in the second place, again focusing on verse 5, we learn that the gospel is not only the triune's God's plan, but in the second place that the gospel is the triune God's revelation in the Old Testament. Look there at verse 5. 
And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Some of you will know that the book of Revelation alludes to or directly references the Old Testament more than all of the other 26 books of the New Testament combined. And beginning in chapter 4 and here, especially in chapter 5 and continuing to the end of the book, the title that John has revealed to him for Christ more than any other is Lamb. And it's not without significance that from these chapters onwards, Jesus is called Lamb 28 times. Numbers are always symbolic in Revelation. Seven times four. The number of seven is fullness, multiplied over and over to say the Lamb is the centerpiece of this book because He's the centerpiece of history. And there's even more Old Testament background here. Did you see the titles by which Jesus is revealed? The Lion of the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49 and verse 10. And what do we have revealed there about Jesus but that this one coming from the tribe of Judah descended from that tribe will be the one who is the king in the latter days. And then when he is called the root of David, that's from Isaiah chapter 11 and verses 1 through 10, where once again we're, we're told about this messianic king who will come in the latter days. But overarching these specific references is the more general title, Lamb, which is pregnant, my friends, with Old Testament imagery, isn't it? Because throughout the book of Revelation, there's underlying it and underlying the Gospels before the book of Revelation, this subtle theme that arises from the latter half of the book of Isaiah. If you read the book of Isaiah, beginning in chapter 40 and then to the end of the book in chapter 66, there's this theme that emerges of this second and greater exodus that the Messiah is going to accomplish. John picks up on that imagery and says the lamb that is slain is the greater Passover lamb from the first exodus. In other words, right there with that latter days prophecy is this second exodus and they come together to show us that Jesus is the one who will lead us out of the worse Egypt of sin into the greater exodus, lead us through the wilderness of this life to the greater Canaan, as it were, heaven itself. And so when John tells us that he sees Jesus as a lamb, who's also from the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David, he is hammering home the second exodus and the importance of the Old Testament. My friends, this is a question for all of us, and I know in this room, I think I'm going to know the answer. But do we preach the Old Testament in our churches? And do we preach it in a way where we don't devolve either into a fanciful allegorism where we try to find Jesus in every passage just so we can complete kind of like a where's Waldo way of doing exegesis? Or do we completely neglect Christ in the Old Testament to the great detriment of our hearers' souls and our own soul? Or do we read the Old Testament the way that it was inspired to the prophets, interpreted by the apostles, and given to us as Christ himself gave us the hermeneutical understanding of the Old Testament, namely, that he is the center of the Old Testament, that everything points forward to him, that being Christ-centered is no less a reality now in this present evil age than it was if you lived in the time of the patriarchs or if you were very much standing there after the fall with Adam and Eve. It's always been Christ-centered. That's John's point. All of it comes together in him. And therefore, the gospel that's revealed in the Old Testament is not a different gospel. It's in types and shadows, as the Westminster Confession of Faith puts it. But it's still very much Trinitarian and Christ-centered. It's not like all of a sudden Jesus comes on the scene and then all of a sudden we learn, oh, there's this, this thing called the Trinity. No, he's 
always been Trinity, his God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, before there was an Old Testament. This God and this God alone is the one who has decreed whatsoever comes to pass and has revealed himself in the pages of the Old Testament and has focused that revelation on the second person of the Trinity himself, Jesus our Lord. You see, my friends, the gospel in the Old Testament displays those two outstanding features of being Christ-centered and Trinitarian. And what I'm anxious for you to see this afternoon is that your Bible is Trinitarian and Christ-centered. That you cannot pick up this book and study it for any amount of time without walking away with a distinct and inalienable and, inalienable and, and very much non-conquerable, unconquerable impression that this book is about a God who's always existed as one God in three persons, co-equal, co-eternal. And that the second person of the Godhead came down and that was prophesied in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New, and awaits the final revelation at the end and consummation of all things. In the third place, in verses 6 through 10, John shows us that the gospel is in fact centered on the second person's atonement. Look at verse 6 through 10. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. The gospel revealed by this triune God is centered on the atonement of the second person of this triune God. And that's where the here in these verses the full Trinitarian scope becomes explicit. Once again, John sees the sevenfold spirit, to better translate the original there. Sevenfold, the spirit in its full in his fullness. The Spirit in His capacity as the one that is now sent out by Christ and the Father to accomplish the Great Commission. The Spirit in His fullness because of Christ's work of redemption which has been accomplished. Moreover, this there's some very interesting linguistic features here. One scholar notes that when you read that phrase in verse 6, a lamb standing as though it had been slain, those are two participles in the original, and they're in a tense that indicates ongoing action, ongoing benefit for those who are united to this Lamb by faith and by faith alone. And this ongoing benefit is this simply, that Jesus' redemptive atoning death brings the ability to conquer in a hostile world for all those who are united to Him. And you see, The fact that he's standing as slain lets us know that he himself has overcome. He's been victorious over the grave. He's the one who is slain as an atonement for sinners. And yet he's the one who is now standing as then the one who's conquered and this ongoing benefit for his people to bring them victory like he has experienced and he has brought to us. So whatever else we might think and other questions we might have about the nature of the atonement, the book of Revelation on chapter after chapter makes it clear that the atonement of Christ was inescapably penal, substitutionary in particular, my friends. There's no room for some kind of unlimited atonement here. Yes, it's unlimited in the fact that from every tribe, tongue, and nation, we are going to be in heaven with all kinds of different people. But not everybody's going to be there, my friends. Unfortunately, 
The book of Revelation talks about that. Revelation 14, Revelation 21. The horrifying reality of the everlasting punishment due to all of those who are not covered by the Lamb's blood. And only those who are covered by the Lamb's blood are in heaven. And that number, my friend, is particular. It's God's doing. It's not your faith or my faith that is somehow effective in making God love us. No, He loves us, therefore we have faith. Therefore He sends out the Spirit to work faith in our hearts. And He has fixed that number. And we ask, why did you do it this way, God? And you know what He answers us? Who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? It's a penal, substitutionary, particular atonement that is being exalted, set forth, held before us for our worship and our joy here in this text. And as G.K. Beale points out, the other feature here that we see, one of the many, is that there's an ironic overcoming here that Jesus accomplishes. He's a lion. But he's slain as a lamb. And that's to once again exalt the centrality of the cross in the worship of heaven and in our daily lives. Remember, John is writing this book, my friends, for suffering Christians. I cannot think of a more appropriate book for us to be studying right now than the book of Revelation because it tells us everything that's going on. What to expect, where to see, all of these things. People are bewildered by ideas today. Where did this come from? How did we get here? And the book of Revelation says, the beast, the one behind the world's systems and his deception. And despite the beast's best attempts, what we see here at the outset of Revelation is that the lamb has conquered in a way we did not see coming. It's to exalt the cross in our lives. That Jesus, the one who is the second person of the Trinity, left his native atmosphere of heaven, my friends, and came down to become that sacrificial lamb, prophesied, pictured, typified in the Old Testament and Passover, and then led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as that sheep prophesied by Isaiah, he was without comment, as it were. And then he was exalted to God's right hand where we meet him here in this heavenly worship scene. But my friends, the same thing, the same pattern will be true of us, won't it? That the way up is down. The way through to exaltation is through humility. The way to conquer is through suffering. The way to gain is through loss. The way to truly live is the way of the cross, daily cross-bearing. Luke 9, 23, if any man would come after me, let him take up his cross daily. Every day we go to a funeral, my friends. The funeral of self, the funeral of sin, the funeral of the old man. Because if you're a Christian, if you're following this lamb, you're following a lamb who was slain. And therefore, you and I will live slain lives. Going to happen if you're a Christian. Every day. I was reflecting this in our our congregation Sunday night in Columbia. Preaching from the Gospel of Matthew and just it hit me afresh how tired I am of my sin. Aren't you tired of the fight sometimes? There's just days when you wake up and you go, do I have to do it again, Lord? And, and when, when you read this passage, though, it's all of a sudden there's, there's fresh hope that bubbles up within you. Because once again, you're brought to Jesus, who was slain for your sins. Not just so that you'll be forgiven in the future, you will be. Not just so that you'll be declared righteous in the present through union with Christ, you are but also because he knows we get tired. And therefore he writes us promises like this and says, it looks like you're not getting anywhere, but there is a day coming when you'll see this slain lamb face to face. 
And when that happens, my friends, every time you said no to sin, every time the battle was hard, every time you felt like you couldn't go on, will all melt away. Because you're going to be overcome by His goodness for you. By His triumph in weakness for you to have the strength to make it through the wilderness on your way to Canaan, as it were. Last thing we see. The gospel, the gospel's goal, rather, is the worship of the triune God. The gospel's goal is the worship of the triune God. Look there at verses 11 through 14. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth, wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. So, before we move to the seals being unsealed, before we learn what life is going to look like between the comings of Jesus, which is what the seals and the bowls teach us they're escalating rep repetitive cycles of seven, seven, seven bowls, seven seals, unsealed to reveal what, what God's plan is in between the two comings of Christ. Before we get there, this passage closes with what all of us need. Worship. And one of the distinctive emphases of this seminary is its respect, its inculcation, and its reverence for not just the Reformed tradition on worship, but what that tradition was always concerned to magnify, namely the worship of the triune God himself. And that emphasis, my friends, could not be more appropriate than it is right now in our time. And as John looks and sees and four living creatures, what do they represent? Commentators are agreed that represents creation in its fullness. 24 elders, 12 tribes of the Old Testament, 12 apostles in the New, representative of the church in heaven. That's what they represent. I know there's debate about that. I'm convinced that's what they are. So what we see here is the worship of heaven and earth of the sovereign lamb and the sovereign creator and sovereign spirit. Worship is the goal. Of the gospel, my friends. The Trinity existed before the world began. He didn't need to make you. Didn't need to make me. Didn't need to make the world. Didn't need to reveal a gospel. Now, because that's what God decreed. That's what he's carried out. For the rest of eternity, we will enjoy the Trinity in worship. That's the goal of it all. That's the goal here. That's why I can remember sitting in Dr. Wilborn's class. He's a fairly new Christian. And him talking about worship. What it was like. Just plain, simple worship. And I thought that's strange. I'm an aesthetics kind of guy. Love music. Last time I did a wedding, though, in a big Episcopal cathedral, I was in it about five minutes and got the heebie-jeebies. Kind of felt like I was looking around a little suffocating, all the gold and everything else. But then you realize the reason why our forebears focused on that simple worship is because they wanted earth to give way to heaven. They wanted the accretions and unbiblical traditions of men to get out of the way so we could get here. So that the triune God could reveal himself and all of his fullness to us in the redeeming work of the Lamb that we might exalt in him forever. And what are they magnifying? They're magnifying the worth of this Lamb who's made us a kingdom of priests. Exodus 19.6, another reference to this Exodus imagery in this passage. 
magnifying the worth of this sovereign God. And that's one of the other features of this text. It's, it's centered on God's sovereignty over everything. That's why heaven and earth, I think in an allusion to Psalm 98, joins together to worship this God. And why are they worshiping him? Because of what the lamb did? Because of what he accomplished? Because of his atonement for their sin? You know, we had one of our daughters ask us a question about my wife's mother who died very unexpectedly a few years ago. Is Mimi watching us in heaven? My wife is still very, very close to her mom. Eyes kind of teared up and she said, no, sweetie. Mimi's looking at the lamb. That's right. <laughs> Nobody there in heaven, first of all, they're not on mission. We don't become like demigods when we go to heaven. You don't get to see everything. Sorry, you're not going to find out who shot JFK. <laughs> it's not what's going to happen, not the point of heaven. The point of heaven is this. Falling down before the Lamb, joining heaven and earth in a fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament in anticipation of the cry that will come in the next chapter. How long, O oh Lord? Until it's all accomplished and Revelation 21 and 22 cease to be words on a page and become a reality we live in. And so, again, do we recognize the significance of our weekly worship? Do we recognize the significance of however small your gathering might be, however unadorned by the world's standards it might be, do we recognize the significance of what we're doing when we're called to worship Lord's Day morning and Lord's Day evening, when we set apart that day, as the Puritans well called it, the market day of the soul. As we set apart that day and give it to the worship of God and the works of necessity and mercy, as our confession puts it, do we recognize that those are not simply abstract duties to be performed, but rather a coming reality to be experienced from the future into the present? That's what weekly worship is. And as we do that, we are saying to a watching world, no, we will not listen to the beast who boasts with his proud horn. We will not buy into the lies of the prostitute of Babylon because we belong to the Lamb. Let me say just a couple of things as we finish here. There's two things, I, I think there's many things this text teaches us, but two things I want to leave you with. And the first is this, that the greatest motivation for missions is the Trinitarian gospel. The greatest motivation for missions is the Trinitarian gospel. A couple weeks ago, I found a diary about 1888 or so from my great-grandfather, Arthur Garner Weldon. He was leaving his family came from Arkansas after the war, ended up on the West Coast. He had felt called to the ministry and said, I'm going to go to Korea. And as I read through his diary, he recorded some 700 miles he walked on foot that first year to share the gospel. And I was reading that in my study, and I, I was sitting there thinking to myself, I've done nothing, Lord. I'm such a wimp. <laughs> I want to meet him. I can't wait to meet him in heaven and say, how many pairs of shoes did you go through? What was it like, brother? Why'd he do it? He's buried over there, along with others of my ancestors. Why did they and countless others do it? Because they believed passages like this. As John Piper put it, missions exists because worship doesn't. The goal of missions is to see people saved by this gospel to exalt the triune God both now and for eternity. And the motivation for those missions is right here in Revelation 5. What greater motivation could there be, my friends, than to know that the Lamb has conquered 
and will conquer. And yes, as John will go on to tell us, that Satan will throw some of you in prison for ten days. And plagues will come upon a fourth of the earth, all which signify tribulation for the saints, for the church. And yet, conquering lamb throughout all of that. What else, my friends, can motivate us but the love of Christ, as Paul tells us? The love of Christ for sinners who aren't here this afternoon, don't care about a theology conference, don't care about the Lamb, don't care about His atonement. Are are we the ones who are going to go to them, wherever they are? With the motivation being the triune God is worthy of all of our sacrifice, all of our giving, all of our going, because for eternity we will exalt Him together. It's an amazing thing when a sinner gets saved, isn't it, friends? Just got a text this week. One of those texts that you sometimes get in ministry. A lot of you pastors and elders here know what I'm talking about, that It can seem like you're laboring and there's no fruit. Got a text. Been doing an evangelistic Bible study. Young man said, I told my wife I want to take the next step with Christ. Then he texted, I woke up this morning and everything was different. I remember that in my life. Remember that day. Remember waking up feeling that way. That's the goal. Another worshiper going to be in heaven by God's grace and grace alone, persevering through the wilderness one day with us, all of us who are Christians. Praise God. Missions. Last thing, the everlasting Trinitarian gospel matters in a changing world. The culture around us, we all know, is continuing to slide into unbelief. But that's not new. Just reading a speech, JFK, 1963, maybe 62, I can't remember. He said, never has our country been more divided since the Civil War. This summer, read the excellent biography of David McCullough on John Adams. He described Philadelphia in 1789. Men cross the street to avoid each other, will not shake hands. All the businesses are closed and people are dying at a rate that we can't sustain in Philadelphia. Sound familiar? It's not new. The culture has been sliding into unbelief, sliding into all kinds of hostility towards the gospel. What do we hang on to in that time, my friend? We hang on to the sovereign God and the sovereign spirit and the sovereign son. The Father, the son, and the spirit who, whose plan, as it were, on that scroll is being unfolded now, and there is no plan B, my friends. COVID is plan A. Suffering for his church, plan A. If you read in Revelation 6, four horsemen going out, what's one of them? Pestilence, plagues. All of the things we see going on around us, this is like everyday life in Revelation until Jesus comes back. And in the meantime... He says, don't worry to us, his people, bewildered, confused, hurt, suffering, depressed, downcast. He says, look to the sovereign lamb. Look to the sovereign God. Walk in the power of the sevenfold spirit. And don't lose sight of what's coming. When is the last time you meditated on heaven, my friends? I have a dear brother with me here, my neighbor, colleague, dear friend. With me this afternoon, we were talking about this on the way up, and he just kind of said offhand, we don't think about heaven enough. Amen. I was thinking to myself, you're right, we don't. And when you, you begin to study and meditate on this, and it begins to fill your mind throughout the scriptures of what's coming to us, nothing we suffer here will compare to the glories that are to be revealed, Paul says. They're light momentary afflictions, real afflictions, hard afflictions, difficulties. Don't want to downplay those. But Paul says when you look at the weight of glory, it's going to be revealed. Those afflictions don't 
matter when it all is said and done. Yes, they're hard now. Yes, they hurt. Yes, we must weep with those who weep. We must help each other in the way. We must point each other to Christ. We must love each other. We must be the suffering community here on earth in the wilderness of this life. And we must always be concerned to encourage one another with saying, but look what's coming. And look who's in control of what's coming. And that will put a rod of iron in our spines, my friends, to persevere for the glory of God. Well, I was excited to actually to hear at this conference Dr. Sanders. Uh, he wrote a book called The Deep Things of God. It's out there. I would encourage you to buy it. Wonderful, wonderful book about the practicality of the Trinity. And that's where I want to finish. Is this all practical, the triune God and the gospel? Um, I remember the story told of Dr. Sinclair Ferguson when he was at Westminster Seminary teaching systematic theology, opening his textbook or his notes on the first day, looking out at the class, saying to them, gentlemen, welcome to the practical theology class. All theology is practical. But Dr. Sanders in that book opens with an illustration that I want to read a quote to you from by Nicky Cruz. Y'all remember him, the evangelist, the cross and the switchblade. He was the leader of an infamous New York street gang in the 1950s, was converted under the ministry of David Wilkerson in Times Square. And, and Nicky Cruz wrote a book about the Trinity. I want you to stop and think about that. Here's a Puerto Rican kid who never went to seminary, who'd been a gang member. And it fascinated me as I read on, then I went to read some of Cruz's book after seeing the reference in Dr. Sanders' book. It's just an amazing testimony, you all. And if you've ever asked yourself, does the Trinity really matter to my life and the gospel in my life? Here's what Cruz says. Quote, something has emerged in my walk with God that has become the most important element of my discipleship. It has become the thing that sustains me, that feeds me, that keeps me steady when I'm shaky. I've come to see God, to know him, to relate to him as three in one, God as Trinity. Pause right there. The most important thing in my discipleship, what keeps me steady. A man who'd robbed, probably killed, stolen, drug addict, redeemed by the Lamb, never been to seminary, probably hasn't read a Puritan paperback, which I love, hadn't done that. What has he done? He's read his Bible. And he says, the most important thing to me is I've come to know God is three. I know him that way. This isn't just a doctrinal formulation to make sure I'm not a heretic. That's important. But those doctrines were hammered out because of the truth of what the scriptures reveal about who he is because that's the only God we should know. And that's who he knows. Continuing, quote, I don't know everything there is to know about theology. I am not a Greek scholar. I can sympathize with him there. I'm just a Puerto Rican street kid whom God picked up from the slums and made a disciple. But there's one thing I do know. God is my father. Close quote. And his point was, if you know him as the father, then you're going to know the son and you're going to know the spirit. And that's who God is. And that's what sustains him when he's shaky. And my friends, the call of this passage is... And the life experience of all of those united to Christ by faith and by faith alone is a Trinitarian experience. The gospel we're called to take to the nations is a Trinitarian gospel. And at the end of it all, the Trinitarian God is worth it because he's worthy. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your word, your revelation, everything you've given us in Christ. Oh, Lord, please make us a a people here who will take this gospel to the ends of the earth, who will know more of Christ and him crucified in our daily lives, and who will revel in the revelation of you as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for our joy and our hope and our overcoming and our weakness in this life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.